Hi there, I'm Paul Ashby and I attend Derby Vineyard together with my wife, Carmel. Uh, this is the Derby Vineyard Summer School of Prayer and Bible Study Devotions and number 19. It's based on Mark chapter 5 verses 1 to 20. Now to do your devotions, please watch this clip. It lasts about uh, 19 minutes and uh, I'm going to read some suggestions for prayer then a meditation, then the Bible passage for today, followed by the study. And after that, some questions for your discussion and some final prayers to close. So let's begin with some suggested prayers of thanksgiving. Now, think about the work that you do. Does it seem important to you or is it just a means of earning money. If you're retired, think about what you do to fill your life. Does this feel important? Now, come before the Lord and give thanks to him for the work that he has given you to do. Yes, everything that your hands do and your mind does. Let him bless you in everything. Now, pause and think and pray about this. Now here is a prayer of confession. Jesus, listen to me now, I pray. Hear me in those moments when I'm unable to make sense of things, so I may take confidence in the provision you have already made for my life. Take away from me the fears with which Satan surrounds me and give me the courage to stand firm against everything I know to be wrong. Turn my life around, I pray, and give me the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now my song recommendation for today for you to stream or listen to whenever you feel it's appropriate is Cessy's Lullaby, sung by Stephanie Gretzinger on the album, her album, this one, uh, not just a Bethel one, uh, The Undoing. And now a meditation. The beauty of life is varied and the endless diversity of things found on earth. Save the world, O Lord, from greed, from the greed which destroys our planet. The wonder of life is love and its essential link to bringing children into this world. Save the world, O Lord, from the demeaning of sex and damage to families. The marvel of life is learning and the truth that it offers everyone a realistic chance. Save the world, O Lord, from poor education and its dire social consequences. The miracle of life is faith and the fact that most people on earth believe in some God. Save the world, O Lord, from its ignorance towards the good news of Jesus Christ. The sensation of life is the future and the awesome destiny you offer each and every person. Save us all, O Lord, from prevarication and create in us the world's true destiny. Our Bible passage for today is Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. It's quite a long passage today. When they arrived on the other side of Lake Galilee in Gerasa, Jesus got out of the boat and was met by a man from the catacombs who had an evil spirit. He lived among the burial chambers and no one could restrain him, not even with chains. 
well, he had been shackled before, but had wrenched apart the manacles and broken all the tethers. No one was strong enough to subdue him. He wandered around through the tombs and nearby hillsides day and night, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And even though Jesus was some distance away, the man saw him coming, rushed up and lay on the ground in front of him, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. And he said this because Jesus had already commanded, Come out, unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked the man his name and he replied, My name is Mob. There's lots of us. And he begged Jesus not to send them elsewhere. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding nearby on the hillside and the evil spirits begged him, send us into the pigs. We can go into them. <coughs> so he gave them permission. The unclean spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs and the herd of around 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned. The herdsmen ran away and reported all this all about, and so people came out to see what had happened. When they arrived, they saw the man who had an evil spirit sitting there clothed in his right mind, the very man who'd been possessed by demons called Mob, and they were frightened. Those who had seen it told those who came what happened to the demoniac and the pigs, and then they pleaded with Jesus to leave their neighbourhood. Then, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded with Jesus to be allowed to remain with him. But Jesus did not allow it and said to him, Look, Go to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. <coughs> So he went straight away and began to preach in the region of the Decapolis all around. And he said that Je oh, everything that Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. <coughs> well, frankly, this is a, a difficult and somewhat scary story. It's not easy to read. And from the perspective of life, as we know it, it's almost incomprehensible. Jesus casts out demons from a man who lives amongst underground caves and the demons then go into pigs who then drown. <clears throat> what is going on? It must have been important to Mark because it's the longest story in his gospel so far. Now, we must start by accepting this importance um, and we must be willing to read this story and its complexities. It is, after all, um, the longest story. Now, there is a clue at the very end of the story where we find that this man is commissioned to begin the very first preaching mission to the Gentiles. That's in verse 20. Ah, now, if we focus on this, we will find the passage opens up to us. Now, this Gentile mission is significant because most Preachers will tell you that Jesus brought the gospel primarily to the Jews. But this isn't really so true. Jesus instructed the disciples early on to go, firstly, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's in Matthew 10, verse 6. But this is a time-limited call, as the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 reveals. Jesus also speaks about limiting his mission to the Jewish people in the same way, using the words only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, when he's dealing with a Gentile woman who comes begging to his table. That's in Matthew 15, verse 24. But Jesus then breaks his principle by helping this very Gentile woman. So clearly there is far more to Jesus's ministry um, than a gospel just for the people of Israel. And remember that the Old Testament tells us that the Messiah must do what the Jewish people have not done, tragically, which is to bring God's message of love to the whole world. Read about this in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6 and 49 verse 6. There's, there's many other references I could give, but these, these will do for now. 
Now, we forget the significance of all this today. Uh, most of us are Gentiles. We don't think twice about the significance of God's message breaking into our world from the Jewish world in which Jesus first lived and worked. We therefore do not easily spot the significance of all of this in the stories uh, we read in, in the Gospels. Jesus did indeed start his ministry amongst Jewish people, but the Gospel tells us well, all of the Gospels, in fact, tell us that he soon began to take his message beyond Judaism to the Gentiles. Uh, for example, have a look in uh, John's Gospel in chapter 4, where he goes to the Samaritan woman, a Gentile. Indeed, when Jesus told his disciples uh, here uh, to go to the other side of the lake, that's right at the end of the passage we read yesterday, um, he knew he was heading into Gentile territory, into Gerasa. It's Gentile territory, not Jewish territory around Lake Galilee. Lake Galilee was divided between Jewish settlements on one side and the Gentile, it was called the Decapolis. Did you remember that name at, at the end of our passage? Which means 10 cities. This is Gentile Roman territory on the other side of Lake Galilee. Now, Jesus' work amongst the Gentiles was very important, and without it, the early church would have found it next to impossible to justify the mission of Paul, which brought the gospel to the wider Roman and Gentile world of the first century. You can read about this in Acts 15 and following chapters, if you wish. This was, of course, the express will of the Father who wants all people to come to know of his saving power. I'm quoting 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. <clears throat> and so let's now look at some of the details of our story to, to see how all of this works. Jesus arrives in the Gentile territory of Gerasa and is met by a man who actually represents the whole Gentile world. It's like a parable. The man is possessed by a demon, is controlled by evil. He lives in darkness, tormented and with no escape from the death with which he is surrounded, living amongst tombs day and night. Now, these words are a classic parable of the, of the Gentile world. And for another example of this, read what Paul says about the Gentile world in Romans. That's chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. My word, you will find a lot of parallels between what he says and this passage here. Mark goes on to say there is no escape for the man from his bondage except through Jesus. Again, so true of the whole world, the Gentile world. The man has tried breaking his chains, but it doesn't release him. Again, think of what that means. And, and he needs a saviour. And now Jesus has come to set him free. When Jesus appears, the demons, surprisingly, know all about him. In chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, they have a clear insight and name Jesus as God's Messiah within seconds of meeting him. It sounds extraordinary. Ah, but now think about this parable that we are developing here. We need to change our perspective in order to understand what is going on. For this describes the way in which Gentiles themselves first responded to the gospel. Uh, witness in Acts how early Christians such as Paul marvelled at how the message he preached was understood almost immediately by people who were not Jews. And at the time, Jewish people remained steadfastly opposed to Jesus. Uh, again, read about this Acts uh, chapter 16, verse 16 following, for example. Uh, so our surprise uh, that the demons know Jesus mirrors Jewish surprise at Gentile acceptance of Christ. Now, the man then plays a rather pathetic card really in in the parable that we're developing attempting to frighten Jesus and the disciples he says we are mob there's lots of us but the detail is inconsequential Jesus is certainly not impressed the demons know they will soon be evicted by Jesus and they feel threatened well now how many times do we think oh the evil is all against us but we say ah but Jesus deals with it but the demons beg Jesus for a route where they can get out of the way. Uh, now, they need somewhere to go. They need somewhere to exist. Evil needs somewhere to go. 
Now then, at the mention of the pigs in this story, Christians today virtually melt down at best into animal welfare mode or at worst materialistic mode. We, we get concerned for the pigs or the livelihoods of the pig farmers. I don't want to uh, trivialise it, but in truth, neither concern helps us understand this story. We, in doing that, we come at it from our perspective rather than get into the story and understand it from the perspective which Mark is trying to tell us the story. From the Jewish point of view, pigs were virtually incidental to life. And those today who focus on their loss miss the point of Jesus's saving work and his actions for the Gentiles. The story is not about the value of the pigs or even where evil goes. It is about the defeat of evil and breakthrough in Gentile mission. How can we be sure of this interpretation? At its end, where most uh, gospel stories reveal their true meaning, we read that the man uh, who has been set free and uh, then the pigs have drowned and he naturally wants to become a disciple of Jesus. And the evil that has kept the Gentile world bondage has been evicted and the man thinks he is worthy. He wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus says no. Instead, he instructs the man to go and tell others all that Jesus has done for him. Well, it's a classic preaching mission. He must take the gospel to the Gentiles, his own people. And Jesus thereby commissions him to take this message to the world. So we ask, did this man do what Jesus said? How effective was he? Well, there is evidence in early church documents that some of the earliest Christian communities did indeed have their origins around the Gentile region of the Decapolis. The man is never mentioned specifically again, but the traditions of the Gentile mission uh, do exist and testify to the growth of the early church. So yes, I think we can accept that this man was commissioned by Christ and it appears he was effective. This is fantastic news. What now are the real preaching points within this passage? It's all about, is it all about healing and deliverance? Possibly. But there is little about deliverance ministry here that cannot be found elsewhere. And I've heard many preachers struggle with this passage. The true deliverance in this passage is Jesus's death blow to evil, which binds the Gentile world and the liberation of the gospel into the whole world, despite its many demons. Most preachers don't speak about the passage like this. Most, despite the best of intentions, find it hard to get into the details. There is certainly more to explore here. I, I have just begun to scratch the surface even of my own interpretation, but I ask you to reflect on all this with care. The explanation I have offered is simply not just my own thoughts to be placed alongside other interpretations. What I have given you is indeed an ancient and classic way of understanding what is for us a very difficult passage of scripture to read. Please treat it with care. And now some questions. If you can, discuss your reaction to this study with a friend. Do you understand the details that have been mentioned? Is there more that you feel you have to explore? Secondly, Check out what you can find about this story in some other publication, perhaps a book that you have or, or a sermon that you can listen to about it, something online perhaps. What do you think of what is said in the light of this study? Thirdly, do you think of yourself as Gentile? What does this mean from the point of view of this story? And now some suggestions for your prayers. Pray for the world which struggles with the evil which dominates it. Pray for breakthrough today in the preaching of the gospel. 
Secondly, pray for those who find themselves troubled by evil, either within themselves or the evil which oppresses them. Pray for their deliverance. A final prayer. Dear Lord God, give us courage to face evil when we come across it and not try to avoid our call to follow you both in word and deed. If and when we face evil, give us the right words to say and a deep trust in you that it may all be defeated, that all evil may be defeated and your glory be shown throughout the world. Amen.